All right, let's get into it. So um, as we all know from our readings this week, um, we're talking about, we chose to talk about uh, stream surface processes. I am obviously serving as the discussion leader this week. And I will be the devil's advocate. And I'm the creative connector. Woohoo. All right. So this was kind of like my cursory title. I figured we'll go further into this, but um, just quickly. So I read the first two articles. So in advance, I apologize. There's going to be a lot of text on the screens because I found these uh, articles very interesting. So the first article was threats to U.S. public lands from cumulative hydrologic alterations outside of their boundaries. Um, if we want to super simplify it, really, the title kind of puts it all in a nutshell, which is always nice. Um, humans have really kind of commandeered all of the fresh water on the planet. Um, we take up about half of it and it's going to just keep increasing obviously uh, with population. So the big hydrological changes outside of protected areas that are heavily affecting said areas, uh, this author broke down into a couple different categories which included drought, municipal growth, hydropower and water diversions. So like dams or um, other, other drainage needs, uh, pollution, leachate, uh, leachate spills and contaminated runoff. This was actually a really long list that I kind of consolidated there, but this included oil spills. This included mining activities, past mining activities, un uh, unconfined, um, underground landfills, things like that. Uh, sediment and acid de deposition, which is both uh, the sediment deposition is from erosion, the acid deposition we talked about a couple weeks ago, we're used to that, um, and exotic species, which I also thought was a really interesting way to kind of tie this all in. Um, I felt like this week was very much not focused on biologic elements, and that was an interesting kind of add-on. Uh, but essentially, because water withdrawals are already really high and just kind of increasing globally, uh, a lot of rivers are dry, running dry much of the year. This is especially prevalent in the U.S. Uh, West. So this author, I think, did a really good job of both tying in international examples to kind of apply the knowledge she found in the U.S., which I appreciated. Um, but especially in the West, they're having a lot of issues with these major rivers running dry. Some of them were, I believe, the... Sorry... I of course can't find the notes that I need. <laughs> um, uh, all right, never mind. I can't find them, so not a big deal. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of these major rivers are running dry, and because they're running dry, then all of the groundwater is essentially polluted because these pollution thresholds are set at a certain level, assuming that they'll be mixing with groundwater or surface water, and then that will be diluting it so that it can be safe for human consumption. This is obviously not the case when there's no water to mix it with. So I thought that was a really interesting kind of facet of it. Um, and it really all kind of stems down to the author really claims that it's environmental needs versus public demands, which especially when it comes to water are usually in opposition. You know, often we find that um, a public need can actually be benefited by environmental needs, but in this case, they're pretty oppositional. Um, the case studies that they used here were Stillwater National Wildlife Refuge in Nevada and the Caribbean National Forest in Puerto Rico. Um, these essentially, again, could go on about this forever, but essentially kind of refuted all the points, uh, kind of emphasized all the points above. Um, it's clear that, you know, example, things that are happening outside of the boundaries of these areas are still affecting those areas. You know, the whole catchment system, which will be in the next article, uh, will just be continuously affected. Um, whoever else read this article, anything I missed that you think is relevant to bring up? Anything else you want to add? Questions, comments, concerns? Joey, did you read this one? I, no, I ended up reading the uh, the water law and then the, uh, the Borden experiments. But okay. from this one, the exotic species, like, they're yeah, like, I assume they're talking about like, non like invasive species and whatnot but i've never really considered them affecting the water quality outside of just like affecting the habitat itself so i just did yeah a quick did it say much in it specifically on what it does to the water or like which species so i don't believe so sorry i read these on sunday night so i'm trying to yeah Make sure I didn't take specific notes about that part. And I don't think it mentioned any specific 
examples, but my personal example. So it's really funny is that I, when I first read it, I also was like, really, I never really thought of that. Um, but recently it brought to mind. So in the Charles river in Massachusetts, they're having a really big issue with, uh, lilies. So I can't remember the species, mm-hmm. but essentially totally overgrowing and they're causing algae blooms, all this awful stuff. And Charles river is used for a lot of both recreational and I wouldn't say industrial, but like certain, you know, public gardens in the area use water from there. Um, you know, there's no big agriculture <laughs> in the Charles river area, yeah. but, um, it is becoming a really big issue. And they, uh, in the past, I think three summers have tilled for them in certain areas of the river and just like pulled up giant swaths because it's becoming, um, you know, it's not just affecting other animals in the habitat anymore. It's starting to affect people. Interesting. Yeah, I did. I I ch- when I, when you made that point, I did a quick, like, google search for it and they really do they talk about um it seemed that mostly it was talking about like uh, uh barnacles and like uh animals that will attach onto the hull of boats going into shipping lanes and that yeah. like affects water filtration or something in the area but they do mention on one about like freshwater algae cyanobacteria and mud snails yeah, that those are big. I know like zebra mussels can um, totally mm-hmm. crust over like drainage pipes and things like that and really yeah. mess with um, water flow there, which is, you know, it's funny because every time I've learned about something like, like something like that, which I'm sure you guys can kind of relate to, I learned about it in a biological context. And while right. the hydrologic and anthropogenic uh, effects are pretty clear, it's easy to kind of ignore when you're focusing on only the biological aspects. So I kind of felt silly when I read this one was like, really? And then immediately had like five examples. <laughs> yeah. But all right. So that's that one. Uh, so the next article is also by CM Pringle, uh, which I just loved that last name. Um, so this is <laughs> managing riverine connectivity in complex landscapes to protect remnant natural areas. Um, so these two articles actually had a lot of overlap, I found. Uh, so most importantly, riverine connectivity is key to ecosystem health and stability. So this means how rivers are connected through streams, through wetlands, through coastal habitats, through marshes, swamps, uh, deltas, floodplains, pretty much anything we think of when it comes to water. They could have the same groundwater source. Like all of this connectivity is really, really important. Um, So human influences pretty much of any kind, agricultural, just walking through the area, anything disrupts this connectivity, but it's pretty hard to quantify these effects and both notice them. So often, um, you know, kind of into the next point, it's often ignored until crises arise because it affects biodiversity and resilience. So essentially these things only, as we know, only get noticed when something's going extinct or it's all chopped down or whatever it may be. Uh, So this one focused a little bit more heavily on the case studies. So these case studies were the same uh, Caribbean National Forest in Puerto Rico. Um, The, I'm not even going to attempt to say this, but um, it's a national park in Costa Rica. I don't want to completely butcher it. And then Kruger National Park in South Africa. And essentially all three of these case studies, let me pull up these um, notes I have on it. So all three of these case studies really kind of showed that riverine connectivity is really important but especially um so the big takeaways was that in Kruger Park the river quality has been degraded so much by erosion irrigation you know poor water quality etc it's pretty much limiting park success at this point which is why people are really uh concerned about it so you know it over affects it affects tourism it affects livelihood all this stuff so they're seeing fish kills they're seeing just abysmal water quality it's really bad um in Puerto Rico of note, Kruger is actually twice the size of the entirety of Puerto Rico. So this Puerto Rico uh, National Forest is very small, but it's one of the wettest areas of the entire island. It receives almost four meters of rain per year, um, provides for a lot of people, including the people who are in like the lowland area of the island where they don't get as much water. So it's having a lot of draws on it. Um, Almost all of the rivers have been dammed people are taking more than 50% of the water, um, which is causing issues with both 
uh, salinity getting upstream. So they're having a lot of overlap there. And they have a lot of species that are reliant on these rivers. Uh, primarily, she tends to mention shrimp, which are actually mentioned in both of these articles. Um, that's partially where my article one summary was so small. I was like, I don't want to repeat everything I'm saying in article two. Um, but shrimp really need to live up there. Uh, and that's being affected and studied. Uh, they've started distributing grants to study this in Puerto Rico, but kind of similar to Kruger Park, it seems like it's only after the fact that it's being acknowledged. Um, and in Costa Rica, the, because they also get a ton of rain, uh, the surface and groundwater has been contaminated by cattle or human fecal coliforms. So that means that they are all drawing on rivers instead, um, which is then can be contaminated by geothermal contaminants. Um, there's also been some introduction of hydropower, which is, you know, controversial when it comes to ecotourism. A lot of these people are against hydropower and further water, water use, um, and the hydropower could eventually affect the groundwater. So that's kind of the takeaways from those three areas, but essentially kind of over all of these case studies and general evidence, the riparian corridors, so like the wetland ecosystem corridors uh, are really essential. And these are kind of the four <clears throat> connectivity factors, which is deterioration of catchments, deltas, estuaries, coastal waters. It's essentially a lot of deterioration. I won't read that all through for you guys. Um, I know you guys are able to do that. And isolation of headwater catchments. Um, so this one above all, like my biggest takeaway was that water systems need to really be looked at in their entirety, not just, you know, this per portion of the river that we're trying to protect, or even this whole entire river from head to toe. You know, we need all the streams coming off of it, all the <clears throat> water basins that are feeding into it. We need the catchment areas, we need the floodplains. We need to understand how all of these things work together and what draws are happening on all of them in order to protect it, which I thought tied in really well to the previous article in terms of, you know, it just kind of proves again that things happening outside of these boundaries are a problem. Um, sorry for ranting at you guys. These were really interesting articles, so I could talk about them forever, but any questions? I, it sounds like you guys did not read them. So questions, no. comments? No, I like I like your summary, your detailed summary, just because I didn't read these first two articles. So thank you for, you know, kind of filling in the gap about them. And um, I guess one of the things I'm wondering is, you know, they have all these case studies and most of them are international. And I got to take a look at that um, website that kind of detailed the water laws in the United States. And so I'm wondering like what sort of water laws they have in these other countries and maybe more specifically in their national parks and national forests that would allow such like water deterioration. Yeah, that is a great question that I'm gonna be honest. I don't know the answer to. Um, wasn't super addressed in this article, but just kind of of my own information, I'm pretty sure Costa Rican national parks, anything like designated nationally protected is supposed to be completely untouched. Um, however, again, like the last article kind of mentioned, that's only within the boundaries. Um, and in terms of Kruger National Park, again, I can't specifically speak for this, but I know that a lot of places, and this may also be the case in Costa Rica, a lot of places that are really uh, centralized, you know, natural spaces that are ecotourist hotspots are usually pretty good at trying to integrate humans into the landscape, which is a good thing for, of course, humans, uh, but clearly not a good thing for water management or water quality. So I am curious to see. My guess is to be that there probably wasn't much legislation having to do with it prior, and that maybe these case studies and further case studies will prompt some action. Yeah, that I, I would I would think that that's my assumption too. I mean, initially I would believe that like in these protected areas that that would include not just the wildlife but also you know like abiotic factors like water. You know, like I'd hope that they're also protecting the rivers within the boundaries. You know, <laughs> um, but I I don't know. It sounds like they're either not doing a very good job or I, I don't know climate change and pollution is catching up to them or I, I'm not sure what the deal is yeah it seems like at least to me I feel very much like 
when people, especially legislators, look at the environment, it is only the pieces of the environment that they choose to see or are most helpful or applicable to them. And all that does, as we've seen every week and in other classes, is it just kicks the can further down the road, right? It's going to be a problem. If you don't look at it holistically, those problems don't just disappear. Um, and, you know, this is also kind of hearkened by the fact I was just doing something in my policymaking class about uh, the Endangered Species Act. And, you know, just because we're protecting species, if we don't protect their habitats, then what does that help? Um, which I think is an interesting kind of correlation there, you know, looking at things particular, you know what I'm trying to say, um, <laughs> out is just not sustainable. Right. I, I feel like, I don't know, maybe there, it's a management problem in these parks. Like they just kind of let the water portion of it just kind of go because I think, I think most people just assume like there's a ton of water out there. So like, why do I have to care about managing it properly or really paying any attention to it? And so I think they just kind of keep their eyes off of them and then they just end up degrading or becoming polluted. Exactly. Um, you right. a, about Costa Rica, man, you made a good point because it's how they, how they're now having to use the uh, uh, river water for drinking water, even though that's technically, it was what, geothermically contaminated, I think it was, but like, yeah. if, if the, uh, if the, like, initial reaction to, like, the contamination and the problems from the cattle and the, uh, influx of people who's like is that not going to also affect this river water that they're now using like it's just moving it on to the next like viable source in the meantime yeah I thought that was really interesting when I read that because I was like wait but groundwater and surface water all feed into rivers and streams so <laughs> yeah well, how does this make sense? But, um, you know, like you said, it's probably just a problem that hasn't expanded there yet. And once it does, they're in a bad position. They're going to have to start using the rainwater and then, I don't know, something might happen. Get some desalination that. devices. Yeah. <laughs> Got to do something. Right. Uh, and, and what do you do when it's acid rain, right? Like, and then you have <laughs> to conserve filtering in. And that's going to cost a lot. Yeah. It's, you know, saving money now to spend more in the long run, which is just ridiculous, it seems They're like. They're just del delaying it. Yeah. Right. And I think another interesting thing about this article is that, um, like, when I think about connectivity and fragmentation, I usually think about land rather than water. So I think that this article brings up an interesting point that it's also important to keep rivers continuous and not just kind of arbitrarily segment them in different places and protect some and not other portions of it because they all you know they're connected and so I you know and I think that that should kind of factor in too when you think about dam construction and things like that I mean when you put up a dam you're definitely uh putting up a giant barrier and now fish can't can't you know I don't know they can't connect with the other fish in their same population and they're isolated I mean what does that do to them I I don't know no and and these rivers are vital for like breeding and harvesting you know people rely on these populations we can talk about Chinook salmon we can talk about you know any population um this article also mentioned I believe the number is that there are 40,000 large dams now, uh, globally uh and I believe I could be wrong, but large dams seems to be more on the scale of like Hoover Dam dams. Uh, and wow. then it's like countless other small dams, obstructions, things like that. You know, we see those in streams that we hike over. Um, it is, you know, people have really taken it upon themselves to alter things yeah. permanently. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's like a lot of blockades that are just like, I guess, going to be permanent structures that you can't really get over especially for a lot of critters like fish and stuff yeah it's rough all right we'll move on to our next article so this one i like super skimmed 
um, just the lessons learned from a suite of CFB board and experiments. So this was the contaminant transport, which was, I believe, studied over 30 years, or it was occurring for 30 years um, at the Canadian Forces Base Borden site. This was a plume that was present from an abandoned landfill, uh, and they kind of took it as an experimental area to do tracer tests and other experimental tests. Um, I This is from me kind of scanning the intro and the conclusion, so let me know if anything is missing, but um, I kind of perked up at the mention of bioremediation and other remediation technology, because I think it's interesting that they made sure to mention both. So I'd be really interested to hear what you guys found in these. So I read this one and the first thing that kind of just, I was a bit taken aback by is that they were, I don't want to say willy nilly because it was controlled, but they were just yeah. injecting contaminants into this, oh. this outdoor, where they turned an outdoor laboratory. And <sighs> I was, I was a bit surprised by that. I don't, I don't know about you guys. I, I, uh, they made they called it something in the conclusion and it was kind of just yeah it was something along the lines of outdoor laboratory but it did kind of as you read it they just add a new chemical or a new trace they're tracing something different every next paragraph and it's it does seem they tested a lot of stuff and it does sound like it was controlled, but it does seem like it's a lot to do outside in the natural environment where you're, you're still determining how much, uh, like how much remediation, how much of these uh, chemicals are degrading in the water and what happens if one of them doesn't, you find out they don't. And now it's just naturally in the, in the surrounding area. And who says it doesn't go into the groundwater from there or whatnot. Right. But it and was, it, you know, a lot. Yeah, and they didn't plan, like, they didn't have a plan to remove the contaminants that they injected in the groundwater either, except in cases where they were running experiments to see, like, oh, it, does this technique catch the contaminants and remove them? You know, other than that, if they were just monitoring the spread of it, you know, like, oh, how does this, how does this travel in the groundwater? They didn't provide any means to, like, collect the contamination after their experiment. Wow. <laughs> so uh, full disclosure, as I was reading the conclusion, I thought it kind of sounded like they were injecting stuff. And my immediate thought was, well, I just read this whole thing about how uh, riverine connectivity is super important and how pretty much everything's connected. So I must be reading that wrong. This must be like them following something that already happened, not adding anything else. So I find that very shocking and really interesting that, um, you know, that was allowed by corresponding governments because, you know, yes, of course, the government is always really good at looking the other way when pollutants are involved. But I would think that the active addition of chemicals and possible pollutants would throw up a flag somewhere. Right. And it, but it seemed like the need to like, take an extra step outside of just doing laboratory experiments and needing to do it in a field setting was like greater than any sort of environmental hazard that like purposeful injection would cause. <laughs> I don't know. And it also seemed like they're explaining that it was like near an abandoned landfill or something like that. And so since the groundwater yeah. might already be contaminated, it's like, oh, just why, why not just put more in here, you know? Oh, geez. It was what? Uh, a, I think it was a sanitary landfill. Yeah. I think it says right in the beginning. Yeah, sanitary landfill, 350 uh, years north is where they did the testing. And it's just, I mean, they do, they do early on in the article make the point to say how this was uh, like a air, the where they're working has been like out of service or out of whatever they were doing since like the seventies. And they're just kind of trying to lay the groundwork that it's an isolated enough area where they can do it, but it does, uh, they do a lot of it. Like I had flashbacks to organic chemistry with all the like ethanes and the trihexyl. And uh, we were, were talking about a lot of, a lot of crazy organic uh, chemicals 
Yeah. And it's not like when they just injected the stuff, even if it was just a minimal or controlled amount, it's not like they would just mm-hmm. were kind of stuck in a Scooping specific area. Out. Yeah, that or they weren't, it wasn't just stuck in a specific area, like it spread pretty far. Like I think they said one contamination plume was like 20 meters deep, 600 meters wide, and 700 meters long. So it's not like a tiny yeah. amount of dispersal, like it goes everywhere. All right, I have two questions. <laughs> First, yeah. was there any um, environmental or bio, well, maybe not environmental, but biologic impacts assessed before, during, or after this? And I guess follow-up question, is there any like follow-up or monitoring, monitoring afterwards of this as well? Um, As to your first question, I think they only really assess the biological effects if it concerned like bioremediation and how it affected the bacteria. But other than that, I didn't see anything in there about like any multicellular organism impact, like anything about fish, anything about algae, anything about any other non-human organism. I did not see anything about. No, it was not. Nothing was mentioned in the um, I don't, I don't think they mentioned, like, it seemed like once they finished talking about what the chemicals and the dispersal and the remediation and everything, they don't really go into any detail about the surrounding, like, area outside of their controlled outdoor lab. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it, I don't know if they even, I might have skimmed through it in the summary, but if they, t- they don't really mention what the water quality or how it's, how after all their testing, like what are, what is like remaining in, of the area either. Like it kind of just, this is what we tested. This is what we found and it's just left. Yeah. So like for your second question, it seems like for each of these individual experiments, they might've like used a tracer to follow the um, contamination plume for like maybe months or even years. But then like after they collected the the specific data that they were looking for, I don't think they went back and followed up with anything. You guys, this is, I think I've been reading too many conspiracy theories lately, but my mind is kind of exploding right now. (laughs) I need to go read it's up Canada. On Canada. Canada, they have different laws, so you never know. I think that's why it's a little anything. bit extra surprising to me. I feel like, um, you know, Canada seems to be pretty on top of both, you know, respecting uh, the environment, you know, working cohesively with the environment, kind of preserving their resources. Uh, so this is surprising. Uh, were there any, you know, super big takeaways in terms of the experiments they were able to run um Um, some of yeah some of what i found was that the plumes tend to like disperse more horizontally than vertically and they were able to determine that because they were able to take like 3d images of these plumes so i guess uh, you know, geologically speaking, like a lot of these experiments were pretty groundbreaking. So they use like new cutting edge techno- technology to like follow the and assess the plumes and stuff like that. But biologically speaking, I, I don't know how, how effective these experiments were. Well, there was one specific chemical. I don't remember if it was the BTEX or the MTBE that they, well, maybe it was neither of those, that they, there was one that they did test that did kind of stand out amongst the others where a lot of the stuff they said really generally bio, uh, like remediation worked well with just time overall, but then one of them that didn't was, it was because of the hydrophobic nature of it. And it had to do I don't remember if it was one of those two I mentioned that were like the common uh, fuels, but if if the hydrophobic nature of something will cause the remediation to like just halt more or less, like we have to 
understand what chemicals have those properties, I guess. Yeah. Before absolutely. putting anything into use. Yeah, like any remediation and bioremediation that they were discussing seems to be extremely like context specific, like you had to know exactly what sort of contaminant was in there and then match it to like a specific remediation technique for it to work. Yeah, because they test what fuels, herbicide, different, mm -hmm. uh, different like just a, a big variety. At a certain point, I kind of just got confused which ones they were specifically talking about. I know, there, kinda... were just, there were just so many. Yeah. And um, so I guess for part of my devil's advocate thing, um, so in one of the experiments, what they did was they injected aromatic hydrocarbons like benzene and toluene into the groundwater. And they said that it took 434 days for bioremediation to clear that contamination. And so just based on that alone, like it sounds like it's pretty, like it's not the most desirable solution just because it takes so long for these bacteria to degrade these contaminants. And that in some cases they even need to inject oxygen into the groundwater for the bacteria to still be alive and be able to continue their metabolic processes in order to break down these contaminants. So, um, and so they thought about introducing uh, anaerobic bacteria that didn't need the O2 to do the bioremediation, but then that's a whole nother can of worms, right? Like introducing a new community or species of bacteria into the groundwater, like what is that gonna do, right? And so it seemed like at the end of this article, it was just like a mixed review on bioremediation. You know, it's like, Sure, sometimes it works, but if it does work, we need to invest so many resources into it by like injecting O2, maybe even additional bacterial species. And so I think the takeaway from it was um, bioremediation isn't perfect and maybe not the right solution to treat groundwater contamination. But as a devil's advocate, I want to push back on that a bit and say that bioremediation has done wonders for giant human human made disasters like um, the Exxon Valdez oil spill, Deepwater Horizon, right? These natural bacterial communities in the water, they're alkane eaters and they were able to gobble up and metabolize the oil. So I think in some situations, bioremediation can work. Uh, but when it comes to groundwater, maybe we need to do a bit more research and maybe invest a bit more funding into that to see if it can actually do similar things as it does in marine environments. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, agreed. I, I think it's really interesting. You know, I definitely perked up when I read bioremediation. I think that's a really awesome avenue. You know, it's, to me, it seems like the least impact way that we can, you know, fix the mess we make <laughs> since we tend to make a lot of them. Um, but yeah, I, I I hope that that continues to be looked further into. And, you know, maybe the specific, spec, maybe the specific nature of these remedial solutions is not necessarily a bad thing. You know, maybe this will lead to legislation saying that, you know, anything that's possibly that has the potential for a contaminant is ultra labeled. So, you know, it helps with transparency. It helps with understanding, you know, let's say a farmer spills all of his pesticide on the ground. He's able to look at the bottle and say, you know, this is what's in it. This is who I call. This is how they fix it. And it could potentially help address these issues uh, better and faster. Right. I agree. The, um, I feel like this kind of tied back to the first paper or the point you just made, Samantha, about uh, the BTEX, which is the chemical that uh, causes the anaerobic environment. Uh, like the introduction of uh, oxygen. They did, I think, present the idea of nitrate, but they said that didn't work because it doesn't, uh, it didn't have to do anything. But like the introduction of the oxygen probably does, it wouldn't, it wouldn't uh, be the cause of the non-native species to come in, but it could amplify certain algal, algal blooms that do like directly harm the uh, groundwater as well or like the water quality as well like even if the oxygen input 
uh, is remediation for this chemical. We don't know the side effect that the increased oxygen does on the actual like uh, like organisms in the water. Right. Yeah. Or like even introducing new like anaerobic bacteria instead of maybe injecting yeah. O2. You know, like what is that going to do to the to the biological community down there? I think they even said in one case they like they injected these, um, you know, like benzene and stuff like that, these hydrocarbons into the groundwater and that the bacteria that were supposed to eat them preferred the other hydrocarbons that were already yeah. in the groundwater. So they didn't even bother to consume the contaminants. And so it was like, oh man. <laughs> they were just right. dumping stuff in there. <laughs> That's really what it sounds they really, like. They really, they were. And I think they still are. Didn't they say like at the end of the article, like, oh, there's still experiments being conducted do, here. Yeah. Yeah. We're still building yeah, they off. Did, of they it. talked about like recently, they mentioned like tests from like the mid 2000s and how like those are ongoing, which I, ongoing as of when the paper was written. I forget when exactly, but like, I wouldn't be surprised if that's still not ongoing. Right. You guys, I'm probably going to spend all night looking into this because this sounds insane <laughs> to me. <laughs> it really, I, I know this sounds so silly, but it really does sound like a conspiracy theory. Like this is just scientists injecting things into the ground for the sake of knowledge. And, you know, maybe it's off the heels of that riverine connectivity article, but it just seems like yeah, it's, it's just not an, you can't control that environment. There's no controls there. Um, but, you know, like you said, Samantha, hopefully this brings up some positive results somehow. I hope so. I hope yeah, I know. hope their contamination is worth it at the end in, in some respects. <laughs> yeah. All right. You guys want to add anything else to this one or should we move on to the next one? I'm good for the next one. <laughs> Same. Great. All right, so again, just kind of with my super cursory uh, overlook, I just kind of looked at the background, uh, was mostly concerning, you know, water law seems to be pretty much focused on agriculture historically, which makes sense given how that's how people, you know, used to interact with water the most. Um, water is pretty controversial between agriculture, municipalities, industry, rec users, and conservationists, which makes sense, seems to be four different perspectives on that. Um, I thought it was interesting that water resource management has historically separated surface and groundwater processes, which, um, you know, as we know through this week's readings and everything are very connected and feed into one another. So I thought that was fascinating. Um, and the two main facets that they kind of spoke about in the background were water rights versus, you know, restrictions on water pollution. So, you know, who's entitled to the water? How do we keep the water clean? Um, and that water quality is managed federally, so the restrictions on water pollution is essentially, but the water management, including water rights, is left to individual states, which I also thought was very interesting, considering, again, nature doesn't know any boundaries like this riverine connectivity. Uh, but please feel free to fill me in on anything else, any other highlights I missed. I definitely think the biggest takeaway is that the water rights are state ran. Um, and it didn't like it didn't seem for for the uh, groundwater at least it didn't seem like it was entirely location based it kind of just depended on what the state felt when this like when these uh, uh, doctrines were going into place like it's not like uh, like the northeast doesn't follow one specific style and then the midwest follows something different it's kind of all over on which states kind of want to follow which doctrine, at least for groundwater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And um, I think just kind of connecting back to the first article, the one that Sarah read, how you said that there's like an inherent tension between dividing water between humans and, and all other life. And the author in this piece uh, said something similar, not only like, um, I guess there's a lot of competing interests for water. So, you know, not only have farmers doing agriculture wanting the water, you have uh, industries with factories wanting the water, you have recreational users wanting a piece of the water, you have municipalities and cities wanting it. And lastly, you have conservationists who want 
a piece. And so it's, it's a lot of people vying for one resource, you know, on top of wildlife and plants. So it's a lot to manage. Yeah. They make a, they make the point early on about regulating water use, but it does, it, it, it doesn't seem like it's as regulated as it's stated early because they go on to talk about in each specific doctrine about specifically for like the, uh, I think it's prior appropriation and the like early settlers doctrines where if you're the first person there, like you're most likely going to be able to use the water how you see fit, even if it's not specifically an appropriate use. It, it kind of seems a little more open-ended out for the use compared to who's actually getting to use the water. So like the, the state, since the state and federal aren't really on the same, they don't, they look at completely different areas of the water. And I feel like it needs to be one or the other. Like if, if each state has their own, uh, water rights, they should also have their own water use. Or if federal is gonna del like delineate how, how, how you're using the water, they should be the ones saying who's gonna get it as well. I just think it's too convoluted if mm -hmm. two different bodies are trying to essentially doing the same thing. Yes, and um, just kind of adding on to what you were saying about the prior appropriation doctrine, um, like that might have been fine and dandy in like the 1850s when like there's only five people right. living in a California, you know, gold rush town and, you know, there's right. plentiful water. But nowadays, is that is that law really going to stand up to modern times? Like, are we just going to let the first person who staked a claim on it to just have however much of the water they want and leave everyone else to just kind of, you know, I I don't know. It seems like a law fit for the 1850s, but not for 2021. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Anything else to add before we move on to our quote unquote questions? I have something to add. Yeah. Okay. I have something. So playing devil's advocate again. So on its head, I think the, um, the prior appropriation doctrine sounds really messed up. <laughs> um, but there, there is a pro to it, and the pro is that um, in California, a lot of the people who are the senior appropriators are actually farmers, um, and uh, the people who are the secondary appropriators are more like factories. And so, at least the farmers, you know, the small, the small, the small farmers get the you know get the water first before the factories and industry so i guess i guess that's at least one perk it's a good way to look at the bright side i'm curious how uh <laughs> how indigenous people factor into this mm, probably probably don't probably not much <laughs> not I yeah would say they, not much they had like two sentences on their water rights and basically like you're allowed to have as much water as um like as much uh, farmland as you have, like as much potential farmland that you have on your, on your indigenous lands. And that's it. So all yeah, of it? <laughs> <yeah. laughs> it's like, and so what uh, constitutes like potential farmland? You know, right. like if it's all dirt and desert, does that mean you're not getting any water? Very interesting. All right. Let's move on over. So our questions, I kind of distilled them. So how are environmental issues transboundary due to surface water processes? So like stream processes, um, we kind of already touched on this kind of throughout our summaries of all these articles. I'll give you guys my brief answer and then we can kind of expand on that. So mine was like very simple. We've talked about this. I feel like every week, uh, you know, nature doesn't recognize human boundaries and the interconnectivity of these ecosystems cannot be stopped, but needs to be honored. So it needs to be, um, you know, they're going to be trans. I think 
the issue of if they're trans trans boundary is really a moot point you know they are they've proven time and time again to be so um you know that riverine connectivity is crucial understanding stream processes are crucial and it needs to be understood and respected yeah i think i think that is kind of like the most um controversial the most like looked at point for this because the you kind of said it best how they don't have the arbitrary boundaries that we we ourselves follow and for states and whatnot um i was just looking at the like they have the usgs has a stream interconnectivity interactive map like it's very blatant that all of this is connected to each other and all these rivers and streams are a major source for uh like fresh drinking water that we use Right. And, you know, you dump something, you know, in the headwater in the Colorado River, they could what used to end up in the Gulf of Mexico. And so it's not yeah. just a problem that's isolated to one state or just one portion of a country. It's it's everyone. Or, you know, we choose to pollute along our southern border into a water basin that affects Mexico's biggest river with their, you know, most water take in the country totally making that up but you know this is happening and you know this is probably much more prevalent in Europe when you know there's a bunch of small countries all jammed together I'm sure they're sharing water catchments uh water basins things like that you know these things um you know it really makes you think what's kind of the point of having all these parceled out pieces when people can't work together to address these transboundary issues because what it will end up happening is everybody loses, right? Right. I mean, and, and water is like a public resource. It's not, it shouldn't just be in private hands, you know, in the select few dictating what happens to the water and, and how they use it, you know, it should be decided hopefully by, uh, everyone who who has a stake in the water so yeah the reasonable use rule maybe mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah i don't know i think whoever gets there first should get it they could use it all right that's what <laughs> one of the laws are capitalism <laughs> i know and even when but, like mean, a second person comes by and has a better use for the water they can't you know they're, they're just stuck with a first person using it you know, I really think this is something that like, sometimes I want to, you know, shake legislators and just be like, we're all in a closed system. Like, do you understand that? Like, we're in a snow globe. It's all together. <laughs> it's all happening. Nothing's escaping. Nothing's coming in. Like, it's all, we got to figure it out. <laughs> There's only X <laughs> amount of water on this planet. We need to figure out how to share it. Otherwise, you know, things will descend into chaos. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was really interesting. You know, I saw actually a statistic in a, one of the first two articles that 75% uh, of all fresh water would be used by humans by 2040. And that blew my mind because clearly our population is only increasing. Um, this is just going to get worse. And if we can't figure out how to manage these issues across boundaries, then for lack of a better word, we are screwed. <laughs> the US already when I was looking at for my stuff, the US already uses 68, 58% of all the rivers, streams, uh, and headwater and all the, uh, for fresh drinking water. Like that is our public drinking water for almost over half of the nation. So it's not, that's not as a astounding number to me, but it is in the grand scheme of things when you look globally. Yeah. Like it's a lot. Got to work on our water recycling for sure. <laughs> um, in terms of question number two, uh, to what extent does water law consider the geoscience of running water and groundwater well, and where does it need improvement? Um, so I kind of said yes and no, which I realize now in the phrasing of the question doesn't make a bunch of sense, but <laughs> essentially, like it does consider the geoscience, but also it doesn't as much. It seems that it, um, again, this is just from my cursory read and my previous experience, it seems like water law really takes into account the geoscience that benefits humans um, without kind of 
acknowledging the rest. So not really acknowledging that connectivity, but, you know, saying that, um, this strata of the stream is enough to filter the water that it's safe for people is great geoscience to include. Um, you know, I, and I think that's interesting that it seems to be kind of picking here and there, you know, picking and choosing what science is listened to. And hopefully that will change in the future and is updated with, you know, current and upcoming data. Well, I guess I have two things to say for this question. One is that I, I live out here in the West. And so I know um, in lean times, we don't have that much water, like in the Hoover Dam right now, I think we're at the lowest point we've ever been in 80 years. And so one who is familiar with the hydrologic cycle and the geoscience of running water would assume that maybe we should put a ration on the water, right? Maybe we should limit how much everyone should take from this public resource. But do we have a ration? No, you can still use however much water you want. There's no limits. Um, even though there's been people saying, I've never seen, you know, like me, this dry, uh, I, there's a fisherman who, who would go out there every day and he got lost because he couldn't even recognize, you know, familiar landforms and, and markers and stuff because it just looked so different day to day because it was just drying up so quickly. And so you would think the laws would reflect what sort of a crisis we're in um, and that we're not getting that much rain. You know, the hydrologic cycle is kind of stopped here and yet the policy doesn't reflect that. Nevada, specifically for the Hoover Dam, Nevada is one of the prior appropriation states. So that's probably one of the leading things. It's not one of the, uh, and it's not one of the states that follows the appropriation with permits for use. It's more or less um, who was there, they can use it, see fit, and then it's divvied out out afterwards. So mm -hmm. it probably is one of the leading factors. I agree. And it just seems like, especially now, the prior appropriation doctrine is just so outdated and it doesn't fit the circumstance, the circumstances that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. It seems to be that that is often the case in policy. You know, policy is made, it seems very static um, when, you know, we know that society is very much non-static. You know, things are constantly changing, updating. Um, you know, these laws were probably made sense for the water use of 100 years ago, 200 years ago, thousands of years ago, honestly, probably, because they're not fantastic. But anyways, um, you know, these things need to change and they need to adjust and, you know, adapt to the situation we're in. You know, if we were experiencing um, really heavy hydrological cycles currently, if we were experiencing floods and extra rains, we would probably need to be adjusting them the other direction. Um, I think, you know, a lot more fluidity rather than rigidity in these laws, especially when it comes to environment, you know, big picture environmental processes is going to become really important in the future. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think another thing I took away from just looking at the water laws is that it seems like in almost every instance, like agriculture is seen as like a beneficial or proper use of water. And so like, it seems like the laws don't really ever try to control or um, regulate how much water the agricultural industry gets even though they get most of the water and so it just seems like there's room for improvement there too yeah it just it definitely is not very strict on use compared to who's using it it seems very strict on who is using the water mm -hmm. and not the other way around Awesome. Um, well, I guess that kind of takes us to the ends of the questions. Um, I, I mean, I really enjoyed the readings this week, but does anyone have anything to add for their like devil's advocate, creative connector, anything else? Uh, no. I have this cool map that I found. I can. Yeah, hold on. Let me stop sharing and you can share. All right. Okay, hold on. Let me give you the co host. Privileges. And it's kind of. Okay. Uh, 
I don't remember. Okay, here we are. So this is what I was looking at early on after reading the water laws and how like it's pretty, it's pretty noticeable how they, there's a lot of the Midwest is kind of either no data or it has nothing. And I, I was kind of interested why that's not really looked into for surface water at least. Like maybe it just passed my mind and it's got no, and it's not surface water and it's main groundwater uh, for drinking water use. But I do know like the Mississippi River goes all the way up into these states up like mm -hmm. here into the Midwest, like into Indiana, into Ohio. And like maybe it's not drinking water because of that, or if it's not used for drinking water just because they have other sources. But it, it's pretty prevalent in the other areas how much the uh, surface water is used. That's really interesting. Um, that's especially interesting because I think that that is, you know, a lot of those gray areas are um, very heavy agricultural sites. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I'm curious if, you know, the no data was, uh, you know, an intentional leave out like they didn't want to provide that data or they didn't want to collect that data they thought it would skew it too much um but i mean even the rest of this is really fascinating yeah you can see what is this nevada mm -hmm. they got no data there that's where las vegas is right i'm sure they want to not have their water use data out because everything's drought and desert and then Las Vegas gets all of the water use. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I'm like trying to zoom in on Rhode Island where I am. I'm like, oh, that looks like 87, 100%. This is wild. Oh, don't Maryland, worry. surprisingly, where I am in Maryland and then in Massachusetts, they both, uh, I can't scroll around anymore. Maryland has got nothing, which is surprising because there's a that lot of That is really interesting. There. Maryland and Delaware no data but i guess i don't know along this east coast maybe it's maybe it's a lot more um groundwater use because of the uh, proximity to the ocean i don't know i was going to say that coastal intrusion probably makes it either really hard to either like get a definitive answer to this question you know get real data yeah and or you know actually use these sources groundwater is probably a pretty significant source <coughs> Mississippi, one county with it. Oh. And they have the biggest river system in the US. That is crazy. Hmm. I wonder why. Yeah, I'd be interested to see. They don't want us to know, that's why. That's what <laughs> I think. It's all a conspiracy. Or maybe, all they're, the way to <laughs> or maybe their water this laws are from... just so messy that they don't really know what portion of what is being taken. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's, that's probably the reality of it, is that they probably don't even know themselves. And even though, mm -hmm. you know, this is important data to keep track of and should be tracked and, you know, there should be data to report here. Um, it's easier to ignore a problem if you don't know what's happening. Yeah. That was my one big, big thing I wanted to share. That's super interesting, Joe. I am glad mm -hmm. you shared it.